Hey guys, I hope you're doing great. Today I wanted to talk about a topic that is not really mentioned often. I don't know why, maybe because there's so many topics and we don't really get to that one. Anyways, I wanted to talk about it. It's called spiritual maturity. What does it mean to be spiritually mature in Christ? There is a parable that I want to read to you guys. It's found in Matthew uh, 13. I'm not going to write it on the screen because it's really long, but you guys can follow along with me in Matthew 13. I'm going to start in verse 3. Real quick before we start, what is a parable? A parable is a short story used to illustrate a lesson. Mm, Jesus used these a lot in the New Testament. Like he, There's a lot of parables. And basically, like I said, it's a story used to illustrate a lesson. And... Um, I would like to use this to show you what spiritually matru spiritual maturity is because I think it's a perfect example. So let's start reading in Matthew 13, 3. It says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate, and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell along thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. The disciple asked him, asked Jesus what this parable meant. And Jesus' response was, Listen then to what the parable of the sawyer means. Verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is a seed along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. There are different types of people mentioned in this parable. And the first one is the one who hears the message, but since they don't understand it, the enemy takes away the opportunity they had. The takes that opportunity since the person didn't understand it and snatches the message that was given to them. Second, the one who hears the word and receives it with joy. Yay, I believe in Jesus. I accept Jesus as my savior. I'm really going to change. I'm going to start reading scripture. New year, new me. Oh, yeah. But then that desire to seek God only lasts for a short time. And when they face troubles or sufferings, they start doubting God and fall away. The third type of person Oof, this person almost made it. They hear the message, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word. They start worrying about things that God has already promised. They start prioritizing cars, things, money, and their hearts are set on earthly things rather than spiritual things. Then the last seed, the one that fell on good soil. This person hears the message of the gospel and understands it and not only keeps it to himself, but he goes out and he tells more and more people about this amazing God who gave up his son for a world undeserving. Which one of these showed spiritual maturity? The last one. Brothers and sisters, a true convert in Christ will need to walk as Christ walked will need to distinguish good from evil and choose to do good. Check out Paul when he wrote this in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. He says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. So many people say, well, it's God's fault because we don't understand the message. No, 
It says that you no longer try to understand the message. So no, you're not even, you're no longer trying to understand the word of God, but you've given up. In fact, though by this time, he says, verse 12, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, he tells them. So he basically gets mad at them and tells them, you should be teachers by now, guys, come on. You have not grown spiritually. You still need someone to teach you. Don't be like infants who need milk, but be spiritually mature. By now, you should be able to distinguish right from wrong. How many years have we been in church? How many years have we known Christ? And if you're a new believer, that is still not an excuse because if you're a new believer, that love and that fire that you have for God should just motivate you to read scripture, to learn it, to have it written, not on your chest or your back or your arms, but rather in your hearts. A scripture written on your arm will do nothing if you don't live by it. Sadly, nowadays believers have adopted this belief that we don't need to do anything. We don't need to try to do good things. We don't need to change our life. We don't need to stop sinning. And that is so sad. So many people say, well, it's by grace that we've been saved, right? So we're bound to mess up and God understands that. He understands that I'm young and I just want to take the opportunity that I have right now that I'm young and enjoy life. C.S. Lewis once said, evil comes from the abuse of free will. When we choose to do what we want, an abuse of the free will that we were given, we show that we have not grown spiritually. And we don't reflect God's love. Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't use that freedom to sin and do whatever you want. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And while it is true that we have been saved by grace, that grace should motivate us. Should be an even bigger reason for us to love God and choose to obey him. And many people say, well, I think I'm walking with God. Yeah. Well, how do we check? Let's go to scripture. 1 John 2 to 3, 6 and 9 says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know God, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But... If anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. So it matters nothing. If you say, I love God, I love him, I'm going to obey him, I'm going to read his word, I'm going to memorize my Bible, I'm going to, whatever you want to do. But if you still have something against your brother, you're still walking in darkness. 2 Timothy 2.14, it basically says, stop arguing, stop quarreling. 2 Timothy 2.24-25 says that we must be able to teach and we must be kind and not resentful why is it so important to not be resentful and i realized this on my own self i realized it because i realized that i was i am resentful sometimes and it's so important to not be resentful because it 
keeps you from growing spiritually. Because instead of going to church with a clean and kind and gentle spirit, exercising the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, you're not doing that. You're thinking, well, I'm not going to say hi to this person because they didn't say hi to me. Or even at home, it keeps you from your first ministry, which is your family. And it keeps you thinking, well, I, you wake up thinking all these negative thoughts about your family or just negative things about your spouse, about your kids. And you hold on to the things that have happened in the past. You have that anger against them. Same believers get offended, have anger or bitterness against someone, think negative thoughts against them, and keep hidden negative feelings or thoughts about things that happened years ago. You're resentful and you're carrying that around with you. And he says the believer must not be resentful because then he's not going to be able to teach. James 1, 22-25 says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away but immediately forgets what he looks like. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Last verse. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Let us be wise and choose to grow spiritually. To be like the last seed that fell on the good soil and produced twice as much. To not only hear the word, but do what it says. This last verse, I love it. I love it because it confronts the person. Are you a child or are you, are you a man, a woman of God? This person says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I did what children do. But why, mom? But why, dad? I don't want to go crying angrily about what they want and all the characteristics that come with that. He says, but when I became a man, I put those childish ways behind me. I don't need to know why or what God is doing in order for me to trust who he is. A child is not on the, is on their television set in video games, unimportant things. A man, a woman of God that has grown and reached spiritual maturity is seeking God. Living a life of prayer, sharing the message, memorizing scripture, preaching, gently instructing, teaching, not quarreling, not resentful, not keeping a record of wrong, not Bitterly crying over the past, but running the race. Forgetting about what is behind them and straining toward what is ahead. Pressing on toward the goal to win the prize to which God has called us. Come on, O oh man of God, O oh woman of God. Set your mind on things above. Grow in the word of God and the message you were preached. My only hope is that we put our childish ways behind and seek to be men and women God called us to be.